Let's take a look at how the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, uses its means to subvert impoverished nations and even democratic governments, to win the hearts and minds of their people and sometimes to gain control of cultural and natural resources to the point of becoming a real controlling imperialist nation. Welcome to Four Seas, One Family. Welcome to Four Seas, One Family, where we share thoughts and opinions concerning life in Taiwan, the region, and the world. I'm your host, James Thomas, coming to you from Taipei, Taiwan, and I'm so glad to have you traveling along with me on this journey, and welcome to the show. Let's take a look at how education has been used by the Chinese Communist Party in this case, as a starting point and in some cases, dividing line to separate people of impoverished, democratic, and free-thinking societies. China introduced a global Chinese language and culture program to the world called the Confucius Institute in 2004. The name of the institute after the legendary sage gave it a sense of mystique. China sought to use the name of its legendary philosopher to project the image of honesty and morality on college campuses and other institutes of higher learning throughout the world. The organization is under Hanban, which is part of the Chinese Ministry of Education and directly accountable to the Chinese Communist Party. In addition to courses on Chinese language and culture, the Confucius Institute sponsors art exhibitions, cooking classes, dance and music performances, as well as invites speakers to expound on Chinese culture and language and history to depict China as a land of people with profound compassion, history, and intellect, which is absolutely true. However, all events must first be approved by Hanban and the departments in China overseeing it to ensure that events are never confrontational, critical, or conflicting with the policies and practices of the Chinese Communist Party. The Chinese Communist Party dictates the contents and terminology used in all departments' teaching materials under its control. This is done to promote the CCP's narrative of correct social structures, personal interactions, policies, and even their interpretation of world history and current events. In theory, the Confucius Institute cooperates with affiliated secondary schools, colleges, and universities worldwide, which shared financing between Hanban and the host institutions. The Confucius Institute supplies approved teachers and materials to teach the Chinese language and culture courses in affiliated secondary schools, colleges, and universities, while the affiliated institutions only need to supply the facilities required to offer related courses. The Confucius Institute's stated public purpose is to promote Chinese language and culture globally. However, this may not be the main underlining long-term goal of the program in real terms. Today, institutions around the world are finding themselves coming under financial stress and are looking for innovative ways to fund or expand their courses. Now, in the beginning, the truth is many Western institutions saw their relationship with the Confucius Institute as a way to bring an income and also build name recognition. Funding from the Confucius Institute came at the right time for many Western institutions. They hoped that their relationship with the Confucius Institute could help them out of their financial predicaments. Over time, they became willingly ignorant to the Confucius Institute's motives while operating within their institutions. Building a sustainable relationship with the Confucius Institute has always been unstable. The Confucius Institute restricts the introduction or addition of conflicting content into their host institution's Chinese language and culture courses. Initially, affiliated secondary schools, colleges, and universities were not allowed to influence materials taught within the Confucius Institute's classes. For example, the Institute prohibited class discussion concerning Taiwan, Tibet, and the Dalai Lama. If not, Confucius Institute instructors carried the CCP's party line or narrative concerning the related topics or individuals. From Western academia perspective, the Confucius Institute's actions resulted in the on-campus suppression of academic freedom designed under political influence. 
schools or other institutions of higher learning entering into a contractual agreement with the Confucius Institute state that both U.S. and Chinese law apply. The contents of the contract limit public disclosure and is terminated if the institution engages in actions that severely harm the image or reputation of the Confucius Institute. Affiliated institutions engaged in contractual agreement with the Confucius Institute obtain substantial funding from their relationship. They don't want to lose their affiliation suddenly, so any decision they make that could endanger their relationship with their Confucius Institute's cash flow could hold them hostage. According to resources provided by Han Ban, U.S. schools that contracted with it received substantial funding and resources to establish their institutions on their campuses. On the outset, Hanban typically provided a U.S. school between $100,000 and $200,000 in startup costs, around 3,000 books and other materials. As previously mentioned, Hanban also selects teachers, and it also provides a school Chinese director at no cost to the U.S. school. Now, according to public annual finance reports, Hanban spent over $2 billion on its Confucius Institutes worldwide. However, Hanban discontinued publishing their spending data after 2017. In reality, to the Chinese Communist Party, the expansion of CI is a priority to build the image of China and the CCP. The Confucius Institute is part of the CCP's long-term broadband strategy to influence and control overseas entities that negatively affect its image and global objectives. The Confucius Institute's stated mission is to provide cultural language learning and commercial and trade cooperation. This is the underlining goal. Chinese Communist Party documents describe the use of the Confucius Institute as a tool for cultural democracy that can heighten China's soft power abroad by influencing China's perceptions and its policies. In other words, once again, the Confucius Institute is an essential part of China's overseas propaganda initiatives to change impressions that conflict with the image the Chinese Communist Party would like the world to receive. In 2004, the Confucius Institute was welcomed into the United States with open arms. However, the same cannot be said for the American Cultural Center, or ACC. The American Cultural Center was a 2010 American $5.1 million U.S. dollar program to counter or balance China's U.S. efforts. Grants were set aside for U.S. schools to create a space on partnered campuses in China. The ACC was to host events and lectures that promoted American culture. However, the ACC faced many problems getting a foothold in China because of Chinese bureaucratic entanglements that limited the amount of American culture that could be promoted and who the program could invite to take part in their programs. For example, a Chinese partner school would not allow U.S. State Department officials to attend events sponsored by the ACC or enable discussion on topics concerning Taiwan, Tibet, or the Dalai Lama. In December 2017, the State Department inspector found that the ACC program was ineffective in achieving its goal of promoting better understanding of U.S. culture and policies through its public outreach in China. And as a result, the program was terminated. However, because of the lack of transparency, reciprocity, and other related concerns, democratic nations that hosted Confucius Institutes became concerned and wanted to keep control of their independence over what is taught within their institutions. They wanted to keep their institutions free from outside state influence and began to change their attitudes towards the Confucius Institute. After long public discussion and criticisms, the Confucius Institute had to renegotiate their agreements with many partnering schools and institutions and allow for better protections for academic freedoms and expressions. Nevertheless, the Confucius Institute's instructors are obliged to follow the line held by their overseeing department under the Chinese Communist Party, or at least defend debated topics in ways that would be more palatable to the CCP. For example, the Chinese Communist Party holds heavily to its nine-dash-line principle 
which states that large parts of the South China Sea are an integrable part of China, which most of the international community simply rejects. Because of backlash and concerns raised by university professors, students, parents, and government officials, several partnering institutions are or have ended their relationships with the Confucius Institute. And maybe as a result, there has also been news stating that the Confucius Institute may undergo a name change to reinvent their image. On August 13, 2020, the United States Department of State designated the Confucius Institute headquarters as a foreign mission of China, which is much like saying it's a direct representative of China's government. At this point, I would like to say that there isn't anything wrong with a nation wanting to share their language and culture to the world. Sharing cultures is definitely a good thing. However, it becomes a problem when a nation plans to export these elements for subversive reasons with expectations to control content without the input from the people they are sharing their content with while at the same time denying opposing thoughts and opinions to be heard. Now, if a nation loses a war to protect its educational institutions along with its freedom, it will enter back into the swamps of destructive reasoning and desperation. It is sad to see that today, the people who have the most to lose do very little to protect their way of living. Those of us who live a life under democratic governments, must cherish what we have because we may have nowhere else to go if our educational institutions, faith, and freedoms are gone. My question to you today are, who is exactly to blame for allowing China to obtain a subversive foothold in institutions of higher learning? What do you think can be done to ensure that entities trying to seek the demise of a nation are kept in check? And finally, What do you think can be done to ensure that cross-cultural agreements are reciprocal? If you found what we have to offer of any value, please click on the subscribe and bell buttons below to keep up to date with our current episodes. If you're listening to our podcast, please subscribe and help us spread the word that we have a lot more in common than we think. We're very interested to hear what you have to say. Before C's One Family, I'm James Thomas in Taipei, Taiwan, and take care wherever you are in the world.